Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, Reimagine Healing, the nine-week journey to transform fear, stress, and illness into a life of purpose and vibrant health. I'm Lisa Bunnies, and I couldn't be happier about hosting this Q&A conversation for the Shift Network, where we'll explore the teachings of Anita Murjani and address questions about her upcoming nine-week course, Reimagine Healing, which begins Tuesday, August 27th. Later, I'll explain how you can participate in this course, even if you can't attend the live sessions. But first, I want to introduce our guest. Anita Marjani is an international speaker and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Dying to Be Me, and her latest book, What If This Is Heaven? After a four-year battle with cancer, Anita fell into a coma and was given days to live. As her doctors attempted to revive her, she journeyed into a near-death experience, or NDE, in which she was given a powerful truth. Heaven's not a destination, it's a state of consciousness. And when when she regained consciousness, the cancer that had caused her organs to shut down began to heal. To the amazement of her doctors, she was free of cancer within weeks. Anita's been featured guest on TV shows like Dr. Oz, Fox News, The Today Show, and CNN's Anderson Cooper 360. Diane DeBeebe has been sold, uh, has sold millions of copies worldwide, has been translated into 45 languages, and has been optioned by Hollywood producer Ridley Scott to be made into a full-length feature film. And in just a few minutes, we're going to open up for your questions, but first, I want to welcome Anita, who's going to begin our call by leading us in an opening meditation, sort of set the stage. Welcome, Anita. It is such a delight to have you with us today. Wow. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, and it's such a joy to be here. Um, And before we get started with the Q&A, I just love to ground everyone and bring them into their body and into the presence. Um, And so what I'd like everybody to do is to start out by just closing your eyes and just getting yourself relaxed. And I would like you to feel the muscles in your body just relaxing and the stress of the day or the week just melting away. Now I'd like you to visualize a beam of light coming from above you and gently entering your body through your crown. It's a very bright beam of light filled with energy and you can allow it to take on any color that it chooses. As the beam of light enters your body through your crown, just see it as it washes away all your tension and stresses as it enters your body and makes its way down through your head as it bathes the inside of your head and makes its way down your neck, bathing your neck and your throat chakra and makes its way down through your chest area, embracing your heart and it makes its way down into your arms and fingers and in your chest it makes its way down through your waist, your hips, and down into your legs. As this beam of light travels through your legs, it's releasing any of the tension in all your muscles. And this beam of light is so bright that it actually creates an aura all around you. All of this is beautiful energy, beautiful life force energy that is coming from the universe above you, but it doesn't end at your feet. So now I would like you to visualize that from the base of your souls, this light departs your body and goes into the earth. Whether you are in an apartment or in a house or wherever you are, this beam of light comes out from the base of your feet and travels downward um, through the building you're in and into Mother Earth. And as it goes into Mother Earth, see it sprouting roots. Just visualize the roots just spreading. And they just keep spreading. And this keeps you grounded. The more roots you have, the more grounded you are in this reality. That strong beam of light coming from the universe 
allows you to have your connection with the all that is, with God, the creator, or the universe, or the all that is, or your higher self, whatever you wish to label it or call it, that beam of light is your connection to everything, to your soul, to the part of you that has always lived and always will. It connects you to all the information that you need to live this life in a joyful and healthy way. And as that beam of light travels through you and into the earth, it grounds you here to Mother Earth so that you may apply everything here as you move forward into your life. And now, with that knowledge, I would like you to come back into your bodies, feeling safe, that you can trust your body and its wisdom. Start to feel your fingers and your toes. And whenever you're ready, I'd like you to open your eyes and Lisa, whenever you're ready, I'm happy to dive into the questions and whatever questions come up will be perfect. All right, great. Thank you, Anita, so much. And as Anita said, we have the rest of our time together to dive into our viewers' questions uh, as we prepare for Anita's upcoming course. Again, it's called Reimagine Healing, and it begins Tuesday, August 27th. And if you want to check out the website and learn more about the nine-week course, you can visit reimaginehealingadvanced.com to see the full description. So let's go ahead and get started with questions. If you have a question for Anita, go ahead and type it in, and I'll be happy to read them aloud. And in the meantime, we've got plenty of questions waiting in advance. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with one that, that you actually sort of touched on there with, with your opening uh, meditation. Um, a few people are wondering, now that you've had this NDE, what are your thoughts on God? Um, so when I was in that state, in the state uh, without my body, I realized that when we die, we leave behind not just our physical bodies, but also our beliefs and, uh, and our conditioning and our gender and our biology and everything. So if we leave behind our beliefs, that includes religions. I completely understood that religion is something that we have created here to better understand or to try and understand what happens beyond life. And so um, there is no separation on the other side. And one of the problems with even using the word God is that different people of different religions have a different understanding of what God is. And I did not experience God as something outside of me. Um, so the way I, this is how I perceive God after my experience. When, so when I died, I felt I had merged with God and I realized that when I am in this physical life, I am an expression of God. And so if you think of it this way, think of a, um, so each of us is a facet of God. So think of a, a prism, you know, like a diamond shape with lots of facets. Um, so it's like a shiny, bright prism with lots of facets. Now imagine that this prism is what we call God, but each of the facets is one of us. So one facet is you, one is me, one is someone else, and one is someone else. So there's like billions of facets to this beautiful, shining prism. So God is the collection of all of our souls. And because we are all connected as this one, um, as in, on this one prism, we have access to everybody, everybody's information, everybody's journeys. Okay, so now what about your individual soul and all the lives it has lived? So here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. So when you think of a prism with all these facets, that's three-dimensional three thinking. Let's hit four-dimensional thinking. Let's imagine if each one each one of these facets is actually not a flat surface, but each one is a prism in and of itself. So that means each facet is a whole prism built together to create this big prism. And so you are not just a flat surface of the prism, you in and of yourself 
are a prism and each surface on your prism is one lifetime. So you are currently living one lifetime, which is one surface of that prism. And so your soul has lived multiple lifetimes and is living, those lifetimes exist simultaneously because that whole prism exists right now. All those lifetimes are right there. Um, so you are a whole prism in yourself which a collection of lifetimes and that is your soul but you are exper ex experiencing one facet of your prism but your prism is part of this whole thing made up of lots of prisms which are connected and that I call that whole thing God. I hope that made sense. Uh, that was fantastic. It sounds very holographic. And uh, <laughs> like you have to really sort of step outside your mind to wrap around it. So thank you for explaining that. That was beautiful. Um, let's go to a question here from Aquamarine who wants to know, after we leave our physical bodies, how much or what parts of our personality continues on? And how did you recognize your father and your best friend during your NDE? So when we leave our physical bodies, um, we lose all our... Um, all our fears and we become less attached. So in other words, there's more of an authenticity and what we take with us, we don't take the fears, we don't take the hurt, we don't take the pain, but what we do take with us is the experience. We can call it uh, the experience, some people call it the lessons. Um, I tend not to use the word lessons because when we use the word lessons, it kind of makes it um, I've kind of moved away from the thinking that life is a school and we're here to learn lessons. And I'll tell you, I'll also tell you why I've moved away from that. It's because when we think that way, we get stuck on looking for the lesson in everything that we're doing. What I tell people is don't look for the lesson, um, just um, keep moving forward and the lesson will be revealed to you. You don't have to think about life being a school and everything we're learning is lessons. It turns out that they're lessons, but I prefer people to see the lessons after the fact, after the lessons become revealed, as opposed to people trying to look for the lesson. Because when we get wrapped up in looking for the lesson, we kind of beat ourselves up when we don't find the lesson and we think, what am I not getting right? I need to find the lesson. No, don't do that. Just love yourself, love yourself through your challenges, keep moving forward through love. But anyway, in answer to the question as to what we take with us, we take the experience. We do take the lessons, but uh, we don't need to figure out the lessons while we're here. So when we are on the other side, um, we feel no pain, we feel no hurt, we don't hold grudges, we feel no judgment towards the people who have hurt us, but we do take the experience of having gone through what we've gone through. So in other words, um, when I one day die, I will take the experience with me of having gone through the cancer. I will even take the experience with me of this life I'm living now of um, sharing my story. So let's take a, another example, Wayne Dyer. Um, from my understanding, I believe that Wayne Dyer had li lived his full potential in the physical, but he had more to do. And from the physical, um, he couldn't, he, you know, basically he'd, he'd reached the potential of the number of people he could reach from the physical. And now from the non-physical, he can reach more people because he had touched so many people that so many people had heard of him. And after he died, even more people went and started reading his books. So he has taken with him that which he created, the legacy he left behind. And so each of us, we kind of take with us our mark and we build on it and we build on it on the other side and we build on it through other lifetimes. But there is no pain, no hurt, no judgment. Everything is an experience that we take with us. Okay, great. Now let's uh, stay on this topic for just one more question and then we'll move on to some other ones. This is a question from Dean who says, I've heard that when people cross over, 
some folks still struggle with their earthly issues until they've worked them out. Therefore, we shouldn't necessarily try to connect with them psychically. Uh, Your father had been on the other side for 10 years, but what if he'd only recently passed when you connected with him? Um, The thing is time, okay, so this this part is um, going to be a bit of a um, mental gymnastic exercise because time is not linear on the other side and your soul exists on the other side even right now Um, because when you die you kind of step out of the facet of your life you step out of this life and you see the whole you you experience the whole you which means all your lifetimes you get to see them as one giant tapestry so I could see my future unravel and I could see my past. So even if my dad had just crossed over, um, he would have, I, I know that I would have still experienced unconditional love. Even if a part of him is already expressing in another physical life somewhere else in another part of the world, I would have still experienced his essence. And this part is, um, is hard for people to wrap their mind around, but um, I have since, because, because it's something I have believed in, but have been hesitant to talk about, but I have since now heard of people who have had near-death experiences where they have experienced the soul of someone living. I have also heard of psychics who have had visitations from the souls of people who are still living. And the reason why this is possible is because time is not linear when you are not in your physical body. Your soul exists um, in an infinite state in every, in every lifetime. It's so, so when you cross over, you will mis- meet the souls of your deceased loved ones. But just because your de- and your deceased loved ones, just because they're not here with you physically, they're still there on a soul level. Um, so to directly answer the question about working out things, um, now I feel that when people um, are in a huge amount of struggle and it depends on the struggle. It's like when they're caught up in a very tight web of beliefs uh, that are fears, fears of death and so on, this may happen that when they first cross over, they're struggling with letting go of that. So there is an initial part of struggle which has nothing to do with the other side, but it has more to do with them not having completely extricated themselves from their physical life. But I think the extrication happens fairly quickly after. I, I, I really do believe that everybody goes on to a very positive death experience, even if they struggle initially. That's only very temporary. Hmm. Okay, great. I can already tell we're going to run out of time before we get to all of the great questions. This is such fascinating information. Um, let's go to a question here from Deborah, who says, what is your interpretation of guardian angels and spirit guides? Are they real or are they just our imagination? Oh, I totally believe they're real, but we can, um, we, we call them different things. We can call them guardian angels. We can call them spirit guides and they can be, uh, people. Well, I don't like to say people cause that, um, that, suggest that they are living bodies, but no, they are uh, beings that may never have lived before. And they may be what we call ascended masters. Now, I use this term very carefully because there isn't a hierarchy on the other side. So on the one hand, even though there is no hierarchy, people, uh, the beings on the other side do have different purposes, uh, you know, they have different experiences. So for example, if you take my dad, for example, my dad did not touch or influence um, millions of people when he was alive, but Wayne Dyer did. So Wayne Dyer's purpose is very different from my dad. Um, so, So although one is not better or worse than the other or higher or lower, 
they, they look at it very differently. It's a very linear way that we look at it here. And so this is why I, I hesitate to say um, ascended masters because that suggests that they're somehow superior. But having said that, there are beings and different beings who come to us at different times and different stages in our lives, depending on what we require at that time. So I sense um, Wayne Dyer coming to me quite a lot because he helped me in that part of the journey of um, putting me out onto the public stage. But not only Wayne Dyer, I also feel helped by my dad because my dad keeps reminding me to go out and live my life fearlessly. But I can't imagine my dad helping a whole bunch more people than his immediate family members. So, um, and so, so we do have guides and, and what I would label as angels are the ones who have never incarnated as physical beings and their sole purpose is really to guide us and to come to us at different points in life. Um, and But also, I do recognize at different times in my life that I am being guided by different... I can tell it's a different energy. The messages are coming from a different energy. Um, I can tell when it's a different energy from Wayne. I can tell when I don't recognize the energy. And just real quick, I want to just share an interesting story that happened to me recently, is that I had started to recognize um, a, a, an energy that was, uh, or a being that w I felt guided by, but I didn't recognize who the being was. And then recently, I went to the Edgar Cayce Center and visited the Edgar Cayce Library and immediately there was this feeling of familiarity and it was like, oh my gosh, those recent messages were from Edgar Cayce. And then in, in, to confirm that, somebody gave me a book, an Edgar Cayce book, and I started to read even in the first few pages. There was so much familiarity that tied to the recent guidance that I had been receiving. And so we, so there are beings who, um, who are, whose work is to, um, is to guide us or to come to us at different points in our life. And we can't necessarily say that they are more, they are higher or better because, you know, they're still here doing the work. So thank you. Thanks for that question. Wow, well, thanks for that answer. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here. I'd like to actually combine two questions because they're uh, different sides of the same coin. Uh, first, Helen says, I've heard you say that the fear of illness is worse than the illness itself. I believe that. I have, I have many lifelong chronic symptoms, not sick enough to be disabled, but sick enough to make functioning difficult. But the doctors can't find anything wrong. I live in a constant state of anxiety that they're missing something. I don't fear death. I fear illness. And then Marie asks, would you say fear is the single most common cause of illness and sickness? Um, so great questions. So I would say, um, it's, although fear is not the only cause, it's, it is a very common cause and it's all, um, it is overlooked and it bothers me that not as much attention is given to it. Now I would put stress um, and possibly anger in the same basket with fear. Stress definitely, stress comes from fear. Stress comes from the fear of not having enough time, not having enough money, all those are fears. So it goes in the same basket as fear. Um, anger also is a great cause of illness when you feel anger, resentment, jealousy. Um, but I feel resentment, jealousy, all these come from fear. Uh, when you feel jealous of someone, it means that you, you don't feel good enough. You don't feel that um, there's enough to go around. And so you resent other people for having it. So all those would go in the basket of fear. But the antidote to fear is truly self-love because with self-love your intuition develops when your intuition develops your trust with the universe develops when that develops you're able to listen to your body um, you, you're able to listen to the communication from your body and that's how the fear alleviates 
So mostly people think, oh, if I have fear, I have to fight the fear. No, you don't, because fighting the fear just keeps your focus on the fear. When you're feeling all these things, it means that you don't trust in the universe. It means you don't love yourself enough. Self-love isn't what people think it is. Self-love, people just think it is self-care, care for my body, go for massages, you know, do a makeover. You can do those things. That's great. You know, it, I, it's, it's, those are wonderful things to do. However, that's not what self-love is because even people who don't love themselves do those things. Self-love means realizing you are much more than just a physical being. Your physicalness is just one facet of who you are. I usually use the analogy of the iceberg. Your physical being is just the tip of the iceberg, but who you really are, your soul, is the whole iceberg. Self-love means getting to know the whole you and realizing this physical self is just one facet of the whole you. Um, and there's so much more to this, and I don't want to take up the whole show talking about this, but, but back to the question of fear. Why do I say that fear is, um, that the fear is worse than the illness itself is because fear can actually be what prevents you from getting well. Um, when people ask me a question like, um, do you feel that what you experienced is a miracle? What I experienced is a miracle. And I say, I don't like to call it a miracle because that suggests that it was a random thing that just happened to me and I'm lucky. Whereas I truly believe that anybody can experience it. But I believe that what gets in the way of experiencing the miracle is fear. Fear is what blocks you from experiencing the miracle. Fear is what causes you to doubt. It causes you to doubt yourself, doubt your ability to heal. Um, it causes you to suppress your immune system and to suppress your intuition, suppress your self-love. In fact, it depletes everything that your body needs in order to heal and in order to experience that miracle. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, then let's follow that up with uh, people who are asking about, there's actually a few questions. People are asking about uh, anxiety, just living in a constant state of anxiety. Uh, what would you recommend for them to, uh, because I would assume that this is a fear, this is a stress thing. What do you recommend for people who are living with anxiety? I would ask them to start, um, to, to start, turning off everything in their life that is causing that anxiety. So here's the thing. One of the uh, default things that people do is when they are dealing with anxiety, when they're dealing with illness, when they're dealing with symptoms, what's the first thing they do? The first thing they do is go figure out what they need to do to alleviate it. It's like, what can I do? What can I take? Do I need to do this more? Do I need to research this? Do I need to read this book? No, what I tell people is you need to do the opposite. You need to ask yourself, what can I stop doing? And if you can stop doing like four things, five things, seven things, and take things out of your life. Like one of the things I started doing was I started taking, watching the news every day out of my life. I completely took that out. I, I limit my time on social media. I, when I'm on social media, I'm only on the things that I want to be on. I don't, um, I absolutely do not subscribe to channels or anything that I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to get into that will raise my stress levels. And, um, and, and there's many other things. Uh, what, what else did I take out of my life? I cut down caffeine dramatically. So, what, so what, what I ask you to ask yourself when you are going through stress, anxiety, fear, every day say, what can I take out of my life? What can I take out of my life? And this thinking of what can I take out of my life and do it even when you're going through an illness, it runs counter to what our default thinking is. Our default is, oh, I need to look this up. I need to research this. I need to read more about this. I need to do more about this. I need to take more supplements. I need to, but I'm asking you to do the opposite. What can I undo? What can I do less of? What can I take out? Um, what, what, am I, what have I been saying yes to that I should be saying no to? 
what have I taken on? What responsibilities that I've taken on have I taken on that I don't didn't want to? Um, what relationships am I in that feel like an obligation that I really don't want to be in? What events am I going to that I really didn't want to go to? Uh, all these kinds of things. It really is about clearing the clutter from your life. And, and, and that actually helps quite drastically with, with fear, with tension, with stress, with anxiety, all of these things. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, if you're just joining us, we're here with Anita Marjani, and we are learning about her upcoming course, Reimagine Healing, which begins Tuesday, August 27th. And you can log on to reimaginehealingadvanced.com for all the details and to register. Um, Anita, let me take that point just a little bit further, because again, we've got other people asking. Uh, we Well, let me read Julie's question. Uh, she says, I'm an empath and I feel what's going on in my body. Considering the serious problems we have going on in this world, how do you handle the energy of the world? Uh, how does one do this realistically? And let me add on that uh, what you just mentioned was were wonderful suggestions, but it almost feels like we have to completely bury our heads in the sand if we're not going to be touched by what's going on. So how do we walk that thin line between stressing ourselves out and still being aware of what's happening? So that's a great question. And so um, I'm going to uh, break this down into, into two things. I want to, uh, I want to touch on two things. Um, I am an empath and many of the people who tune in to me and who are attracted to my work are empaths. And so uh, I completely relate to you and I really appreciate your question because I completely relate to you. So an empath has to really be aware that their energy um, is that they, they are physically affected by everything they read and see and feel. They feel it. Uh, in their bodies. Because of this, they really do have to be selective as to what they ingest. So this is point number one. Point number two, an empath is somebody who by nature is a, um, is, is a light giver, is someone who by nature wants to help everybody. Okay, so you need to understand this. There's two points, to, two parts to this. Um, so because by default, you always want to be there to help people. However, when you allow yourself to be exposed to everything that scrambles your energy, you are then unable to do what you came into this planet to do, which is to help people. Um, when I, before I had cancer, I was somebody who was always there for everybody else. Um, I, my problems seemed minor compared to everybody else's problems. Even though I was tired, I was drained, I was affected, I was affected by people watching them get sick, I was watching my best friend get sicker and sicker, but I put my feelings last and it was affecting me. It was really affecting me, but I kept telling myself, I can't bury, bury my head in the sand. I have to be there for her. She's my friend. And I would keep just burying my own feelings. What ended up happening is when I got my own diagnosis of cancer, um, I felt tremendous fear, but at the same time, there was a small part of me that said, ah, now you get to take care of yourself. In other words, my body, my body is smarter than I am. My body had to manifest something really big so that I would listen to it and stop feeling that everybody else's problems were bigger than mine. What I have understood as a result, not from the cancer, but of dying, is that in order to truly be of help to other people, and this is the case if you are an empath, if you are a people pleaser, if you are someone who identifies as being a doormat, this is for you, this is for you. You need to put yourself first and not feel like you are burying your head in the sand when you are removing yourself from the problem and taking care of yourself, because when you take care of yourself, your natural way of being is one of a light giver. 
your natural way of being is one is a person who uplifts the world. That is who you are. That is who you came here to be. But when you throw yourself out there without taking care of yourself, what ends up happening is that you get buried in everybody else's feelings. Now, the line that you can't bury your head in the sand was a line, and I'm so happy you, you shared that, that you said that, the questioner who said that, is uh, because that was something that was said to me all the time before I got cancer. You can't bury your head in the sand. And so that's why I would put myself out there feeling I need to be out there on the front lines. I can't bury my head in the sand. Whereas after dying, I realized I'm not made the same as every single person. I'm not made the same as most of the people out there. I'm made differently. Um, and we can see being an empath, you can see it as a gift or a curse, but once you identify what it is, you will realize it's a strength and it's a beautiful gift. The challenge or the weakness um, or the, the hardest thing for an empath to do is to take care of themselves. The easiest thing for an empath to do is to look after everyone else. So what does that mean? That means you need to focus on taking care of yourself. That's where you need to put your awareness on taking care of yourself because taking care of other people is what you will naturally do when your energy is high. That's just who you are. It's your default. Um, it's something you cannot not do. You are a light giver. It's what you will do. But when you don't take care of yourself, the world is deprived of your light and the world needs you. So you must take care of yourself first. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Beautifully. Beautifully answered. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and you may have actually just answered this question, but we'll see. Uh, Diana wants to know, what was the biggest surprise for you during the NDE? Um, wow. So the biggest surprise for me was that, um, that I wasn't judged for anything because I had spent a lifetime of beating myself up and I realized I had been the biggest judge of my life. Um, so that was the biggest surprise. There was no judgment coming from any other. And that was a huge surprise. And the other huge surprise was that, um, that all I had to do was to love myself. The biggest surprise was learning how loved I was. I realized that all of us, every single one of us are loved unconditionally and that we are powerful and magnificent beyond what we believe or have been conditioned to believe we are. And that was amazing because I'd always felt that I was small and, um, and I would always dim my light and I was always would make myself small and I never had a voice and I was really shy. Um, I never thought people would want to hear from me. And so the biggest surprise was realizing, oh my gosh, that's not who you are. You are magnificent and powerful as we every single one of us are. And I realized that uh, these, this is more than one surprise, but I realized that each and every one of us is a direct connection to source. We don't need third, third parties. I was someone that was always encouraged to seek the guidance of gurus and to worship and pray to gurus, you know, people who are um, supposed to be uh, connected to God or connected to the divine. Whereas I realized, no, I have my own connection. We all do. We don't need third parties. Uh, so all of these were incredible surprises for me. All right. Wow. Thank you for sharing those. Um, I'm looking at the clock here. We have time for plenty more questions. But before we get into those, uh, let's talk a little bit about the course itself. Uh, people are asking questions about that. So I'll go ahead and answer those. Uh, once again, the name of the course is Reimagined Healing. And this is going to be just a phenomenal nine-week journey under Anita's guidance where you'll explore the transformative power of reframing your approach to health and well-being by listening to the wisdom of your soul. And the nine-week course takes place on Tuesdays at noon Pacific, starting Tuesday, August 27th. And a lot of people are asking about this. If you can't join us live, that's fine. You won't miss the teachings. You'll receive audio and video recordings, transcripts, 
and all course handouts on your course homepage. And also, don't forget, uh, the Shift Network offers a no-risk money-back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you a full two weeks until September 10th, in this case, to make sure that you absolutely love it. And as an added option, all participants are welcome to connect in a private Facebook community group so you can stay connected with one another. Also, everyone who registers receives the Reimagine Healing Bonus Collection. First, you receive a video teaching from Anita entitled, I Love My Ego. Then you'll get another video teaching from Anita, and this one is called, I Don't Know How to Love Me. Finally, you'll receive an audio teaching from Wendy DeRosa entitled, Are You an Empath? How to Stop Taking on the Energy of Others. And when you sign up for the nine-week journey, you'll get instant access to Anita's first five-module online course with the Shift Network, and that was called Transforming Your Life Through Near-Death Experiences, where you'll experience guided near-death journeys to release beliefs and fears that have kept you from living fully and joyfully. And you'll also receive the bonus collection that came with that course, which includes a video teaching, an audio meditation, and an ebook excerpt from Anita. So before we get back into questions, Anita, let me ask you, what are you most looking forward to sharing in your your new upcoming course? Oh, I'm really looking forward to diving deeper um, with people on certain areas or certain topics. Because one of the things I noticed in my last course is I noticed the number of people that didn't know how to love themselves uh, or the people that um, didn't love themselves and the number of people who related to being empaths, people pleasers, doormats, and also the number of people that were struggling with illnesses. So these are the main things, and people who are struggling with fears and anxieties. Um, so these are the exact things that I will be addressing in this particular course. And what I will be inviting people to do from the beginning is I'm going to ask them to um, imagine that they are entering a retreat for the next nine weeks. And although, of course, in between classes, they will have to um, go back to their regular lives, but I will also be giving them guidance on how to deal with their regular lives between classes, because what we're actually trying to do is to have them to kind of retrain their way of being and, their, and the way they operate in the world over a period of nine weeks. So this course is going to have more discipline than the last one. There will be exercises and disciplines that they will have to follow through the week. And, and it won't be anything that I tell them that they have to do because everybody is unique, but they are going to actually develop their intuition and they're going to tap into their intuition and come up with their own discipline. And then we will also try and establish a system of accountability so that they can report back the next week as to how they did during that week. So over a period of nine weeks, they should really start to see some huge changes in their lives, in their health, in their um, in, in their self-love, in their intuition. All these things will be developed and heightened so so that's what i'm really excited about because it's really like taking people on a nine-week journey all right I, i'm personally looking forward to it as well i know in the in the first course one of the most important things i learned was when you said uh your only job is to remember who you really are and just that one sentence just changed my life so so welcome everyone to the second uh, second course good stuff yeah. thank you I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because I've, um, I've already got so many thoughts and ideas of how I really want to take people deeper into themselves and how to implement it in their lives and to really, really um, experience actual, you know, heightened intuition, heightened awareness, heightened wellness, all of it. Well, folks, go ahead and join up. It'll it'll be a good time. It'll be uh, good stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and get back into the questions here. We've got uh, two people asking. Tatanya and Phyllis are both asking, is there any kind of hell on the other side? No, there isn't. There really isn't. Hell is Hell and heaven are right here. We could say heaven is on the other side, but the other side uh, has no opposite. 
So we, we create hellish lives, many people do. I know I felt my life was hellish when I was living in fear and going through illness, uh, but we create it right here. Okay, perfect. Let's go on to another topic entirely. This is a question from Trinity who wants to know, what do you think about the concept that we inherit traumas and illnesses from our ancestors and that we can communicate with them in order to heal? And is this something you discussed with your father on the other side? Um, so I think that a lot of things are open to interpretation. So I think that a lot of, um, a lot of the things that we learn, like for example, um, I have heard that, that people believe that we inherit traumas from our ancestors. But I think that the way we do it, so it is possible, but there is an explanation for it in that, um, let me see if I can make it really tangible. I know that I was fear-based because of my dad, and I know that I was fear-based because my dad was fear-based. So if you think in terms of... Um, we are energy beings, not physical beings. We're actually energy beings first and physical as, uh, and the physical part of us is how we express ourselves, but we are energy first. And if you think in terms of illnesses, fears, um, all of this is basically in our energy. Our energy is what we take with us wherever we go. We don't see it. Now, you know that when somebody, um, when, uh, sometimes when somebody walks into a room, you don't even see them, but you can feel their presence in the room. You can feel when somebody is depressed or sad, and you can feel when somebody has very joyful energy. Joyful energy is very big energy. Sad and depression is very small energy. In my course, I will talk a lot about how to expand your energy because your very presence when you have expanded joyful, healthy energy, your very presence can heal people in a room. And so if you're a healer, that's the other thing. My course will also be addressing healers and people in the healthcare. So because your very presence can help in healing other people. So if you grew up with parents or grandparents who had um, a lot of fear, fear of illness and so on in their energy, inadvertently that is what you will be picking up as a child and this is how we pass on energetically we pass on emotions now i'm going to say something that's a little bit provocative but i will say it anyway and when i say provocative i mean provocative by medical standards uh, conventional medical standards when people say that illnesses like cancer and so on are passed down in their genes and they think they only think in terms of physical and they think it's passed down that I got cancer because it's in my family. I actually don't think it's a physical thing. I think it gets passed down energetically because if you have a parent, a mother who has cancer and who is in that energy of cancer and who fears cancer um, and then uh, and then this is what you know and this is what you were brought up in then you have kind of picked it up energetically, not physically, but energetically. It's gone into your consciousness. It's gone into your belief system. If you say, oh, my aunt had cancer, my mother had cancer, my grandmother had cancer, then it's gone into your belief system, into your consciousness. And, and sometimes we manifest this. If we are highly suggestible people, and some people are more highly suggestible than others, and empaths happen to be more highly suggestible. I don't say this for you to f so that you feel fear, because on the other hand, you heal faster as well, because you're highly suggestible. But when you're highly suggestible, your body absorbs all these things energetically. And so when we get things from our ancestors, it's not that they passed it down to us, but we can choose to strengthen our energy. And that's one of the things that I really talk about, how to strengthen your energy, how to clear your energy. But yes, we, we absorb fears from our family members and beliefs that get embedded, like um, beliefs like this is in my DNA and so I'm destined to get it and so I have to whatever, have a mastectomy before I get it. You know, that's a common thing that happens in the medical paradigm, but I don't subscribe to that. I hope that. All right. Sense. Well, thank you. 
It, it, I completely agree with you. So, yes, <laughs> you backed me up anyway. Thank you. Um, let's go to a question. Um, I know that you, you have addressed this in your books and, and many times, but Christian is asking, what's your opinion on nutrition when it comes to healing cancer? Um, so I think that although nutrition is important, it's not the primary um, healing modality for many cancers. Um, so I don't want to make a blanket statement. However, I do know from speaking to hundreds of thousands pe of people now who have disease and illness that they know that their illness was caused because of their emotional state, because they were people pleasers, doormats, um, because they absorbed everybody else's emotions. So um, the primary um, thing that we have to heal is our fear. It is our, st our, our stress, our fear, our lack of self-love. Those are the primary things we have to heal. And then when we start to, when the fear starts to alleviate, the self-love grows, the trust grows, the intuition grows, then we use our intuition to ask our body what does it need in terms of nutrition to be supported. And then we follow what it says. Then it becomes important to listen to the body and give it the nutrition it needs. Um, and here's why I say that has to come later. Because if you go in for the nutrition first, when you are still fearing the, the, the disease and you haven't healed the fear yet, so you're still in fear, I'm in fear of the disease, I'm going to kill the disease, I'm going to eradicate it, let me see what I have to do. So you attack the disease from a place of fear. Then everything you try to research and find out about nutrition, you're coming at it from a place of fear. You will read information that is contradictory. You, you will read sites that will say, eat this, don't eat this, and other sites that will say, eat this and don't eat this. This is what I went through. I researched everything. I ordered everything online that I possibly could, supplements to help me to help, help my body because it was antioxidants. I had to eat, I, I grew my own wheatgrass and I tried everything. And when I would read different sites, it would contradict other sites. And that made me even more fearful. What I never did was heal the fear and turn inward. So when you're coming at it from a place of fear, even the nutrition is being put into your body from a place of fear. And it makes you really fearful as to whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing when you hear different people contradict different things. Whereas when you heal the fear first, you increase the self-love, you develop the intuition, then when you start to tune into your body, you, you will be guided as to what is right for your body. And when you are guided, then you only research those things that you are being guided to research. You come at it from a different place. You come at it from a place of, um, this is going to help me to go from here to optimum wellness. Um, I'm doing this because I want to live long. Uh, I love myself, I love my life, and I want to live long. It's a very different energy from, oh my God, I got to get rid of this illness. Um, that energy of getting rid of this illness, that energy of fear is actually holding you back. So the first thing to do is to heal the fear. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. Then let's follow that up with a question from Janet, who just asked, do you believe that it's possible to heal yourself whichever stage cancer is currently present in your body? <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask because I was literally dead from cancer. <laughs> so where there is breath, there is hope. So here's the thing. It's not about the stage of cancer. That's ir irrelevant. It's about your... Um, it's about your purpose for life. It's about your soul's purpose for life, for living. So I would take people on a journey and I suggest you do this if you're, if you're dealing with this. The first thing is absolutely do not lose hope no matter what stage you're at. The second thing is do not focus on the cancer. Do not focus on healing the cancer. 
focus on living life. What do you need in order to live life? Um, what is your reason for living? Discover your purpose. Discover who you are. Learn to love yourself. When you eat healthy foods, do it because you want to live long, because you love yourself. And even if you have to go to treatments, go to treatments, but don't... Um, so in other words, go, go to your treatments, but don't make them the focal point of your life. Make living life the focal point of your life. The biggest determining factor of your health is your reason to live, your purpose for living. You've all heard stories of um, people who have lost a loved one, um, you know, somebody who means a lot to them and after they lose their loved one, they lose their reason for living and very shortly after they either develop a serious disease or illness or they die. That's because they've lost their purpose for living. So when you are um, in a state of illness, it is about developing your reason to live. That is so very important. It's about asking yourself, if I had a clean bill of health now, what would I do with the rest of my life? What would I do to celebrate? And, and it's about living a life of celebration. Um, the other thing I tell people is if you have a loved one that is suffering from an illness, don't treat them like a sick person. Treat them like somebody who, has, who still has a lot of living um, in them. So if they are well enough to go out, take them out. So it's not about going there and fluffing their pillow and all. It's really about grabbing them by the arm and saying, hey, let's go for a ride in the car. Let's go to the beach. Let's go have an ice cream. If they're well enough to go dancing and you know they love dancing, say, let's go dancing. It's, it's, it's about that. It's about retraining your your um, energy, your brain to see you as a well person as opposed to constantly reinforcing every day that you are a sick person. Okay, well said. Let's try to squeeze in one last question. I think this is a perfect way to wrap up. This is Claire who wants to know, would you say that your illness was the best thing that ever happened to you? Yes, it was. And yet at the same time, I would never um, say to someone who is going through an illness that this is the best thing that is happening to you. So I'm very careful how I phrase that, but yet it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Everybody I know who has been through an illness and has healed from it has said it was the biggest gift. And that's exactly how I feel. Because when people say to me, the cancer nearly killed you, I say, nope, it saved my life. I was killing myself before that. Um, and so it, it is the greatest gift, but yet if someone had said to me that this is a gift while I was going through it, I would have hated hearing that. And so I'm very careful not to say it to people while they're going through an illness. However, after they've come out of it, um, and after I've come out of it, I definitely realize that it is the greatest gift. Um, and also, the other thing I just wanted to add here, because it's an add-on from one of the previous questions about the fear being greater than the illness, the word cancer also has a lot of fear, and, and it shouldn't have. And I know I have lost my own um, sensitivity to the word, but it used to be a big fear word for me beforehand, like huge. But since dying and coming back, I've lost my own sensitivity to it. But I am aware that a lot of people are sensitive to the word. So I do try not to use it. And, and during the course, that's one of the things I'm going to do is because, because my job is to see everybody as healed. And it's to hold that space for you so that you can see yourself as healed. And, and so, um, and so I, uh, I consciously, when I'm working with people, try not to use words that trigger fear because I don't see people as needing to be healed. I see people as already healed, but just with a few things that are blocking them from seeing it for themselves. All right. Wow. That's, I think, a good place to end. This has been a, just a truly illuminating hour. I want to thank our viewers for being with us today and for all of your fantastic questions. Reimagine Healing starts Tuesday, 
August 27th. And again, you can visit reimaginehealingadvance.com to learn more and to register. So, Anita, before we let you go, do you have any final words? Um, well, what I always say is don't take life too seriously. Have fun. Don't forget to laugh. Enjoy life. Really, uh, that's the best thing you can do. Love yourself like your life depends on it because it does. And I truly hope to see you on my nine-week journey. And um, until then, I'm sure I'll see you soon somewhere on the Internet. All right. Well, thank you again, Anita. It has been just delightful speaking with you today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Lisa, and also thank you for the, to the um, viewers for their questions. They were beautiful questions. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. On behalf of all of us at the Shift Network, I wish you well and look forward to having you on this course or perhaps another one in the future. Have a great day, everyone.